I am continuing the series on prayer. Uh, we, we began uh, many, many weeks ago talking about the importance of prayer, talking about how I believe that it is crucially vital for the believer to have a prayer life. I, I truly believe with all of my heart that, that if we are going through life without talking to our Heavenly Father, you, you are basically creating um, an avenue for the enemy to traffic in your life because you're not combating what is taking place in your life. Prayer is our line of communication. Does everybody understand that prayer is our line of communication with our Heavenly Father? I believe that it's, it's, it's really awesome the way, the way it, it fell, the way these messages have, have fallen together. Today is about the prayer of provision. It's about God being the provider in your life, how God wants to provide not only for your physical needs, but also for your spiritual needs. And that's the two points that I'm going to make in today's message as we look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And we're gonna, we're, I'm going to show you in the Scripture how not only does God want to provide for you for your physical needs, but He also wants to provide for your spiritual needs as well. And, and man, what a perfect setting. Uh, this is first Sunday. We're having fellowship dinner. We're going to be we're going to be supplying our body with some food that, that we that we want that we need or or, or, or want in our life. Uh, and we're also going to be feeding you spiritual food today. And, and I mean, this is perfect. It's a, it's a perfect setting of how God is going to provide in your life. God wants you to depend on Him to be your provider. Amen? Come on. God wants you to depend on Him to be your provider. Yes. Whew. Man. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 16, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how in Exodus chapter 16, we're looking at the natural needs that God provides into, into man. And as you're turning to Exodus chapter 16, um, I'm just going to kind of kind of show you that the children of Israel, have, they, they, are, they have just come across the Red Sea. They have left, uh, left Egypt, and they are, they are just now getting to the other side of the Red Sea, into the wilderness. And this is, about, this is about one month after leaving. This is about the time frame of about one month after leaving the bondage that they were in in Egypt. And they come to, and, and you don't have to look there, but in Exodus chapter 15, this is a good story for you to read in your own time, but in Exodus chapter 15, in verse 22 and following verses to the end of that chapter, we see them coming to the well or the place of Marah, which means bitter. They came to a place where there was water, but the water was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. And God told Moses what to do to make the water drinkable, and he did it, and the water was drinkable. God had just provided water for the nation of Israel after they had crossed the Red Sea. In chapter 16, beginning in verse 2, we see where God is about to start providing the physical needs, the natural needs, the food that we need for our body to survive. In Exodus, Exodus chapter 16, verse 2, in the Amplified Version, it says that the whole congregation of Israel grew discontented and murmured and rebelled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the Israelites said to them, What, would, what that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we had sat by the pots of meat and ate bread until we were full? For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this entire assembly with hunger. Let me just refresh your, mem your memory just for a moment. Because in Exodus chapter 3, when God was speaking to Moses at the burning bush, do you know what he said? He said, I have heard the cries of my people. I have heard the cries of their oppression. 
But the, the children of Israel right here in Exodus chapter 16, they are complaining because they are in a place where they're, they're hungry. They're physically hungry. How many, people, how many people here get hungry? I get hungry. I'm hungry right now. One donut does not hold this fat boy. Okay? I'm ready for some food. I'm ready for some physical food. I hope y'all brought some good food today. Because if not, I'm going to Whataburger. But I know y'all brought some good food. But God wants to provide food. The children of Israel, just, they just witnessed a, a, just a sure enough miracle of God. They walked through the Red Sea. They were trapped by a body of water with an enemy coming at them full force to kill them. And God redeemed them. He set them free. He opened up that Red Sea and they crossed over. To, they just witnessed an absolute miracle. And now they're complaining because they're hungry. How, how many people do that? Yeah. I, I'm, I do it. Yeah. Look, when my belly starts rumbling, I, I don't, I'm not happy. I tell Tina all the time, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm going to die. She says, you're not going to die. <laughs> no, but I feel like I'm going to die. I need food. In, in verse 4, look what he says in verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will cause bread to rain from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day so that I may test them or to determine or to prove, and I'm going to go a little bit further in detail about this testing, this proving that's going to take place. How many people know that we need proving? Amen. How many people know that sometimes we need to be put to the test? How many times have we said something with our mouth, but, but we're not really willing to back it up with our heart? Yes. We just want to sound holy. We just want to sound real righteous to other people around us. Or, you know, Facebook is, a, is, is this huge platform that we use, and we, we use platform, that platform to our advantage. We, we share uh, scriptures, and we share information on Facebook to, to get the Word of God out there. But how many people use Facebook as a platform to condemn other people? That is wrong. I'm going to tell you, I don't care how spiritual you are. God never gave you the authority to condemn anyone. No amens on that one. So he said that I may test them, that I may determine, or I may prove whether or not that they will Walk the walk and talk the talk. Now, my Bible didn't say that. I just added that. But he says that whether or not that they will walk obediently in my instruction. Amen. Basically, are you going to do what you said? Because God said, I will do what I said. I will fulfill my word. And in Exodus chapter 16, verse 5, he says, And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare, or, or, uh, that they shall prepare to bring pr twice as much as they, gathered, as they gather daily, so that they will not have any need on the seventh day. We all have needs. Every single person in this room, every single person that is listening to us on Facebook, every person that is listening to us on our website right now across this world, we all have needs. In Matthew 6.33, he points out, he says that if we'll seek him first, these natural needs, these, these needs for food, clothing, housing. Is that, is that what, his word, what his word says? In Matthew 6.31, he says, don't worry about these things. What you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father knows, He already knows your needs. We saw that in Matthew 6, 8 last week. We pointed that out in the week before that. He knows before you ever ask Him, but He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from you, just like you want to hear from your children. And, and, I, and I, use, I use adults and children all the time as an example. You know, we have, 
We have teenagers, so, so at this point in our life, you know, we only see them when they want something. Or we only hear from them when they want something. But God wants to hear all the time from us. We would, we would love to hear from them all the time. Oh, man, thanks. Thank you for that, man. That was an awesome meal. You know, we, we want to hear from our children, and God wants to hear from us all the time, not just when we are in need. But He already knows what we need. I mean, He even tells us in His Word in, in Philippians 4.19 that He will supply all, not some, but all of our need, not our want. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into that in great detail because we could, I could stand here all day long and I could point out things that, you know, it's the desire of our flesh. You know, we, we could do that all day long and we could mark things off. And, but what is the heart? What is your heart? And I pointed this out many times before. Are you seeking after God's will? Because when you are seeking God's will, you're not going to be asking to fulfill your flesh. You're going to be asking to fulfill His will. When you are seeking Him with a whole heart, when you're seeking after God to please Him, to glorify Him, yes, yes. He, He'll, and I said this last week, He'll start to change your will, your desire, to His will, so that when you ask, you're glorifying Him. Amen. Not about me. See, if, if we don't depend on God for the things that we need, then we'll start seeking out some other source of provision. Let me say that again. If we do not depend on God for the things that we need, then we'll start to seek out other sources of provision, such as man, or woman, or a job. You know, you don't need no man. You don't need no woman. Now look, don't start tweeting, my pastor said, I don't need no man. But when you start depending on the man or the woman or the job to supply you with what you need, I used to tell people this all the time. When I really, really bought in to giving in to the kingdom of God and laying up treasures in heaven, when I really bought in to the fact that God is my provider and I started giving of my finances, I used to tell people on the job all the time because in construction it's always, you know, you're going to get laid off, you know, they're always wanting to lay you off for this reason or that reason, whatever. So let me tell you something. This job is not my provider. God is my provider. This job is the means by which my God provides for me. When you get that mindset, when you get that thinking inside of you, you don't worry about man. You don't worry about what man can do. You start wanting to please God. You start wanting to glorify God with your life. You see, it was times like this in my life that God started proving me. I, I shared with you in Exodus chapter 16 about the proving, the testing. God used a time in my life, there were, there were, and I've shared this in my testimony before, there was a span of about eight months where I was unemployed. I was out of work in the construction world. And it was, it was right after I really sold out and committed to giving, financially giving and sowing into the ministry. And, I was, I, and I'm going to tell you, this was a true test. Because God began to, He began to prove in my life he began to test. What, what exactly is the testing, the, the, the proving? What, what is testing or proving? Does anybody know? Anybody know? I wrote it down somewhere. Well, I don't know where it's at. But it, it's... I shared this Wednesday night with the men. When you put a precious metal in a fire, it's not to destroy it, but it's to remove all of the impurities or the inqualities and to bring out the pureness of that metal. So say, for instance, if you put gold into the fire, you're not destroying that gold 
but you're causing all of the impurities to come to the surface so that those impurities can be scraped off and then you're left with a pure product without anything wrong with it. That is the purpose of when I get put into the fire, so to say, when I'm tested or I'm proven. And so many people, I've, I've heard so many people get really hung up on this whole testing thing. God will never test you. I'm not going into that teaching today. It, it's coming in this series. I do believe that He'll lead me to a test. I'll just throw one scripture out there to you, and it's in Matthew chapter 4. It says that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. It did not say that He tempted Him. It said He brought Him to the place where He could be proven, tested, so that the purity could come out. I do believe that I am led to the place where I can be proven Amen. so that I can put my words into action. I, anybody can walk around and talk faith all day long. Amen. It's real easy Amen. to talk faith. Mm -hmm. Let's put your faith to the test. Amen. And let's see. And God used that time in my life when I was unemployed for that long period of time. And I can tell you, and, and, and Tina can attest to this in my life, is that we never quit giving into the ministry. We never lowered our dollar amount. We never did. We, in fact, we started increasing because we were saying, God, I trust you to be my provider in my life. And I started, he started proving that in my life. And I can tell you, now does that mean that you do this right here? I don't know if the camera's going to pick me up, but do you just do this and say, okay, God, I need it. You got to put your faith into action. I didn't sit on my hands. I got out and I worked. I, I, I mowed grass. I painted people's houses. I cleaned people's houses. I helped work on people's houses. I built things and I sold things. I didn't sit on my hands. I said, God, I know that you're my provider, but you're going to give me the strength that I need to do these things every single day so that I, that, that, that I will never have lack in my life. And I can promise you this to this day. I had more groceries in my cabinets than I ever have before working and going to the grocery store and buying them. I mean, they were just overflowing. We couldn't shut our cabinet doors all the way. That's called proving. That's called proving. If we would seek the source for our supply before we seek the provision, the source would provide the supply. Look, this is not a, this is not a tithing message. I, I don't do those very often. I, in fact, I think in my, in, in my entire ministry, I might have done it once or twice, maybe. I do believe that it is important. I do believe that we should give. That's how the ministry keeps going. But that's not today's message. See, a lot of times when we start depending on ourselves instead of God, we start trying to figure out things on our own. Instead of trusting Him, we start trying to make things happen on our own. And we see that in, in the next passage of Scripture in Exodus chapter 16, in verse 15. It says the Israelites were puzzled when they saw this. He's talking about this bread that was coming down out of heaven. They were puzzled when they saw this, and they said, what is it? And they asked each other. They had no idea what it was, and Moses told them, it is food from the Lord. It is the food that the Lord has given you to eat. And these are the instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs, not wants but needs. You see, God knows your needs. God knows your needs. He knows what it, it takes in your life to do the things that you need to do. He knows that you have need of food. He knows that you have need of clothing. He knows that you need a roof over your head. He knows that you need these things. It says, each household should gather as much as it needs. He says, pick up two quarts for each person. See, in the, old, in, in the King James, it's called an omer. In, in, our, in our English form of measurement, an omer is about two quarts, okay? So he says each person is going to grab an omer or about two quarts of manna every day. 
He says, so the people of Israel did as they were told, and so they gathered a lot, and some gathered a little. But when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. You see, when you do what God tells you to do, when you're obedient to God's command, you're not going to go without. You're not going to live in lack. He says, when they measured it out, everyone had just enough. Those who gathered a lot had nothing left over. When they gathered an omer for every person, or about two quarts for every person in their house or their tent, they had just enough. And those that gathered a little, they had enough. Each family had just what it needed. If we look on down into verse 20, he says, those who kept extra, and, and this is where we start getting into our own understanding, this is where we start getting into trying to figure it out on our own. He says, those who kept extra till the morning, it was full of magnet, maggots and it stunk. It rotted. I, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard preaching about that verse of Scripture right there that say that it's a sin to save your money and invest in the stock market. That's hogwash. God gave you wisdom. He gave you wisdom to be a good steward over what you are blessed with. Now, I don't have stock because I sold it all. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not wrong. But listen to what he says. He says, those who kept extra till morning, it was full of maggots. What did God tell them to do? Grab one omer for every person for each day. No more. Everything that they gathered, thinking that they would have more and that they would have plenty. Yeah, but God, I don't want a single Whopper with cheese. I want a double Whopper with cheese, and I want the extra large fries with the super large drink. Is that really what you need? But it's what I want. I have a figure to keep here. It's what I desire. And we got so mad. Uh, I, I hate throwing in these corny little stories, but it's funny. Because we had gone to a basketball game, uh, on Tuesday night or something like that and we were on our way back and we were coming through the big town of Devers, Texas and we stopped at a gas station and they had a burger joint in the gas station and so I, I'm looking up at the thing and I'm like, oh man, I want that big old gig I want, I want it to look like that big picture right there. <laughs> man, I was hungry. You know, I had been eating sunflower seeds for like a couple of hours. I was, I was becoming anemic and uh <laughs> I told the lady what I wanted. It came with mayonnaise on it. And everybody that knows me knows I hate mayonnaise. I can't stand mayonnaise. That's the most disgusting product on the face of this planet. Amen. And I said, amen, brother. And so I said, ma'am, I, I don't want mayonnaise. I, I want mustard. And what did she give me? She gave me a patty, a piece of cheese, and mustard. Where's all that other stuff that was on there? I wanted the, I wanted the lettuce, the tomatoes, the onions. I wanted the, I wanted the sweat that was coming off on the pitcher. You know, it was juicy looking. It looked wonderful. That's what I wanted. Tina said, <laughs> and, and I, I was like, this is disgusting. I'm not going to tell you everything I said. I wasn't happy. But those who had, who kept extra till morning, it was full of maggots and it stunk. But look what he says in verse 24. He says, On the, he, the Lord is very adamant about his, his Sabbath. Okay? And, and in today's culture, we get hung up on whether the Saturday or the Sunday. Look, he says on the seventh day is the Sabbath. There are people in this room that are refinery workers. And you may, your, your Sabbath may be on Tuesday. You may work Wednesday to Monday. I don't know. You work sick days, sick, you work, you better work sick days. You work six days, and on the seventh is the Sabbath. It's the day of rest. The, and that's, the, the, Lord, the Lord says here, he says, on the six days you're going to gather one omer per person. But on the, seventh, on the sixth day you're going to grab double so that you'll have enough for the Sabbath so you won't have to work on the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. He said, in verse 24, he says, on the Sabbath... What was left over was wholesome and good 
and nothing rotted. Just a few passages of Scripture before that, when they were grabbing all the extra, say, on Thursday, Friday morning, it was rotten. And it had maggots in it. But when they did what the Lord said, in other words, when they trusted God, this is the simplicity of this message, when they trusted God for their provision, they had enough. Amen. When they gathered according to God's word, they had enough. And it was not rotten. It was good. It was good. I wanted to use an analogy in this when the when the bread was coming out down out of heaven, I was going to go in there and take a bunch of them rolls, and I was going to throw rolls out there at y'all. But there's people in here that would fight over rolls, so I don't want to do that. But God wants to provide for your physical needs. God wants to be your provider. Not only does he point that out in the Old Testament, but he also points it out in the New Testament, where he wants to be your provider but he wants you to want him to provide for your life. There's nothing wrong with having a job. Don't walk out of here today and say, I'm quitting my job because God's going to provide for me because I'm going to call you a fool. But he wants to be your spiritual provider, your spiritual provider also. God wants to provide for our spiritual needs. I used this example, and I, and I said this earlier today, that in Hebrews 4.15 says that, that he, talking about Jesus, was tempted in all points like we were, yet without sin. He says, and, and that word, again, and this is where I wrote it down, I couldn't find it earlier, is, uh, it's a Greek word, it's called parazo, and it means to examine or to prove. So Jesus was led into the, into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be examined, to be proven. And it's absolutely necessary in every believer's life. I believe that we all need to be examined. I think we need to be examined as believers because a lot of times we start veering off the path and start doing our own will. I pointed that out a couple of weeks ago. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not our will, but it's God's will. What purpose are you trying to prove here? What purpose are you trying to fulfill here? It's God's will, not our will. But Jesus was led into the wilderness by the, by the Holy Spirit to be proven, to be tempted, to be tested. In Matthew 4, 4, it says that people do not live by bread alone. See, Jesus was quoting Old Testament Scripture. He was sharing Deuteronomy 8, 3. This is a word that God had given to Moses. He says... People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So now we're transitioning out of the physical nourishment that our bodies need. We all need physical nourishment. We all have a need to provide our physical body with the energy that it needs to go through everyday life. We need that. We know that. But the Word of God tells us, not only in the Old Testament, but Jesus reassures and reaffirms that Word, saying that it's not all about the physical nourishment. There is a spiritual nourishment that you need as a believer. And when you choose not to fulfill that, when you choose not to feed yourself that spiritual nourishment, you will become anemic. You will become uh, weak in the spirit. You need that spiritual strength to go through every single day. I heard a, I heard a preacher say on the television this uh, morning, and I, I wish I could remember everything he said, but it was spot on perfect. Uh, he said something to the fact that people are always blaming the devil about their problems. Or, how, how, I can't even remember. I don't even want to tell you now. I done forgot. Maybe I'll have it for next week. I have to go back and watch that message again. But we need spiritual nourishment. So he says, every word that comes from the mouth of God. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, it says that God gave pastors to feed with knowledge and understanding. In John chapter 21, Jesus was talking to Peter saying, feed my sheep. There is a need for us all to be fed. Feed my sheep. Over and over again, Jesus was telling Peter, three different times, as a matter of fact, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. How do I get the understanding? How do I get the knowledge that I need to be able to feed the sheep? 
I've got to learn to communicate with my Heavenly Father. I pray that throughout this service and, I, and or throughout these messages that I, that I push you into a prayer closet. I, I do. I, I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna kick you into a prayer closet. But you, every single person, I truly believe that we all need a prayer time. I, I truly believe we all need a closet. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be a door like this going into a room. Maybe, maybe you just need to walk out in your backyard where no one hears you talking but you and God. Maybe that's your prayer closet. Maybe that's your place where you can communicate with your Heavenly Father to receive the nourishment you need. We all need that. We all need it. Job even said he, uh, in Job 23, 12, he was telling how his love of spiritual food far outweighs the physical. Job 23, 12 says, I always obey his commands. I love the words from his mouth more than I love food. God called Job a righteous man. Was, was Job righteous because he liked spiritual food more than physical food? Maybe he was righteous because he was the biggest giver in his church. Maybe God thought he was righteous because he, he, he knew all the right words to say. Maybe that's what it was. Just like David, he had a heart after God. Did that mean he was a perfect man? No. But he was accounted for righteousness because he put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God. Psalms 119 verse 103, the psalmist tells us that God's words are sweeter than honey to the mouth. I don't know if y'all like honey or not. I like honey. In fact, it's, it's pretty close. It's getting pretty close in our, in our area. I need to start taking a teaspoon a day so I, can, so I can build up my immune system to keep from sneezing and hacking and coughing all the time. How many people do that? I don't know, I don't know if the rest of the world does that, but here in southeast Texas, we, we take a spoonful of honey every day, local honey, and it builds up your immune system against all the, all the, the junk floating in the air. I love honey. But the psalmist is telling us how much more sweeter the Word of God is than honey. In John chapter 6, verse 51, Jesus says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. You see, the Word is spiritual nourishment. In 1 Peter 2, 2, he says, Like newborn babes, you must crave sp pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into the full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. I've used this example before. When these little babies, everybody that has these little babies, when they start getting hungry, they start crying. They want some nourishment. We should be the same way. Just like they so desire the milk from their mother, we should be desiring the milk of the Word of God. We should be so desiring God's presence that we want it beyond anything else, above and beyond anything else. Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, in verse 32, if you want to turn to John chapter 6, verse 32, it tells where Jesus is the true bread. He says, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. He's talking about spiritual bread. He says, the true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, give us this bread every day. And Jesus replied to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never hunger again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We kind of saw a similar, a similar verse in John chapter 4. You remember when Jesus was at the well? And he, and he told that woman at the well, he says, if you'll drink from this well, you'll never thirst again. And she said, but sir, you don't even have a bucket to load at, lower down into the well to get water. You see, he was using, he was using, a, he was using an analogy to, to convey to her the need for an eternal well of life. Verse 48 of John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread that gives life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, and then they later died. He says, but the bread from heaven, he's talking about the bread, him from heaven, the bread from heaven has come down so that no one who eats it will ever die. This is not talking about some radical, you know, whatever, Jonestown or, or what's that white Waco idiot? Uh, David Koresh. Y'all been watching that garbage on A&E? I did. I watched it. I remember it when it happened. He's not talking about some radical ideology, whatever. We are all eternal. Every single one of us have a fleshy body. This body is going to die one day, and I'm going to become worm dirt. Okay? I'll be pushing up daisies someday. But the real me is going to spend eternity with my Heavenly Father. Amen. You see, I've got that assurance in my life. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt. I don't have to have somebody pray me into eternity. I don't have to have somebody uh, beg God. Oh God, he was such a wonderful pastor. I don't know if you think I'm a wonderful pastor or not, but maybe you do, maybe you don't. That's not why I'm here. But I know beyond the shadow of a doubt of the relationship that I have with my Heavenly Father, and I communicate with him on a daily basis. You can have that communication with him. He says, he says, he is the bread that come down from heaven and no one who eats it will ever die. He said, I am that bread from heaven. Everyone who eats it will live forever. My flesh is the life giving bread that I give to the people of this world. He is very clear in his word how he wants to provide for you physically and how he wants to provide for you spiritually. But you got to want it. You got to desire that yes. just like the babies, just like that scripture I shared in Peter, that desire that sincere milk. We've got to desire the sincere milk of the word. You've got to want it. You, you've got to, you've got to want to be nourished by God. You know, what we're going to do here, when we partake of communion, he says, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. What did Jesus do? What did he do for you? He provided the living water that you needed so that you'll never thirst again. He provided the living bread so that you would never hunger again. This is not going to turn into some magical drink that's going to sustain your life. This is not going to turn into some magical food that's going to sustain your body. He said, do this in remembrance of me. I don't ever want you to forget the sacrifice that I gave for you. That's how much he loves you. He loves you that much that he wants to have that kind of fellowship with you. He wants to communicate with you. He wants to provide for you. He wants to provide physically, and he wants to provide spiritually in your life. Amen? Amen? I don't know where you're at in your life today, but if you've been teetering on that, on that fence saying, I really want to trust God, I really do, but it's so difficult. In a sense, it is difficult, but in a sense, it's really not. 
He's just waiting for you to take that step and get off that fence and say, God, I trust you. I trust in your word. It took me a long time to get to that place in my life. I'm not going to lie to you. And my wife will be a, she can testify of that, that it took me a long time to come to the place where even when I, when I was facing these things in my life, I was facing despair or I was facing whatever it was, whether it was unemployment or, or whatever it was in my life, it took me a long time to come to the place to say, I know it's going to be okay because daddy's got me. It took me a long time to get to that place, but I can tell you, the, man, the assurance that I have in my life, the freedom that I have in my life to be able to say, I know he is my provider. He's not just the provider for this physical body, but he's the provider for my spirit man. And my spirit man is way more important than this physical body because this physical body is going to die one day. But I'm going to live forever in eternity in the presence of my Heavenly Father. And you can have that same assurance in this room today. You can have that same assurance wherever you are in the world listening to this message today. Don't let anybody ever convince you otherwise. Don't let anybody speak a lie into you to say that you're not worth it. Don't ever let anybody speak a lie into you to say that God doesn't care about your problems. Amen. That is a lie from the enemy. That is the only authority that he has in your life is what you allow him to have. He puts that thought into your head. That's why the Word says to take up the shield of faith and turn away all the fiery darts of the wicked. If you are believing the lies of the enemy, you are not suiting up in your armor and you're not coming against the devil. Let me tell you something. D Jesus has already defeated Satan. You don't have to get out there and work for that. You don't have to go to the battlefield and fight Satan. He's already been defeated. That's what I heard that preacher say this morning. There's nothing you can do to make him more defeated than he's already defeated right now. All you got to do is walk in it and receive the blessings of God in your life. Amen?